afternoon. And welcome to Murder and Coffee. TPK Roleplay is a GM talk show where we discuss all things TTRPGs and game mastering. I am Tyrant, and I will be one of your co-hosts this afternoon. I am joined by our second co-host, the lovely Osiris Franco, as well as two very special guests who will introduce themselves shortly. Today, we will be discussing conflict resolution and facilitating tough interactions in TTRPGs. For all of you DMs, aspiring actors, and intrepid adventurers out there, we will be accepting audience questions throughout the stream. While all of you think about some things you would like to ask, why don't we introduce ourselves really quick, starting with Sarah. Hi, I'm Osarix Franco. Uh, I, I play TTRPGs on all over the internet, uh, and I GM a, a show here on TBK Roleplay, The Bard's Refrain. Um, I uh, think this is great, and yes, purple, standing crew versus sitting crew fight. Uh, I'm going to kick it over to Luca. Hey, I am Luke Lock. I am a dungeon master, sometimes player, and design coordinator for TPK Roleplay. Uh, kicking it over to Saint. You're muted, Saint. Yes, professional. My stream ended at 7 a.m. Um, I'm DMF Saint. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Twitter at DMF Saint. I am a GM here at TPK Roleplay for Roundhouse uh, Omega, as well as Roundhouse Alpha and running things over at Nat20, another channel. And now, we're back to what, Ty now? Yes, and hello. I am Tyrant, uh, a GM staff member and host for TPK Roleplay. You can find me on Twitch and Twitter at Dr. Tyrant. Uh, now that we have the intros for the day out of the way, how about we get the show on the road? Hello, everybody. How we doing? Hi. Saint Sleepy. I, Sleepy. I tried to kill a bunch of people in my morning session. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're still feeling the repercussions. You survived. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> um, I have to. I have to check in. We. I see. Saints got coffee. I have coffee. This mug is massive. It's ginormous. I am a small human, but it's. it's I very... have water because I need it. <laughs> it's important to stay hydrated. Uh, awesome. Um, let's talk about some things and stuff and times. So I want to get out up front because uh, we've got like a broad. Uh, group of like folks not only in chat but like with us right uh, most of the time on this show we talk about like streaming GMing uh, and I think that's going to be a big part about what we talk about today uh, but I want to just up front say GMing for a stream and like a show and for like entertainment is very different than like GMing for a home game but some of these principles still apply so like I don't think you need to like sit down with your like group of friends and be like here is like the manifesto. However, I think it's really important to create respectful spaces. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a good way to kind of introduce that topic and, and explain a little bit how we, how we start on that uh, is first by, as always, it's very important that we mention uh, the player safety and consent form that we send out for a lot of our different campaigns and one shots. Uh, it is an incredible resource. Uh, I don't know exactly where it came from, Luca. I'm sure you could expound on that a little bit. Um, but I used it to plan my uh, four part mini series that, I, that is going on right now. Uh, that's strong apocalypse and horror vibes a lot of uh, potentially saddening things uh, in it, as an apocalypse typically does. Uh, so being able to plan that with everyone's kind of green lights, yellow lights, and red lights uh, built into the campaign was really nice for me so that I knew where I could set those boundaries. Um, but another thing that we should, we should definitely talk about is... Uh, GM house rules and things like that. And Luca, you have an incredible uh, form, uh, an incredible list of house rules that, you know, Sarah today used some of those house rules and so did Cole to inflict some massive damage and do some really cool story things. Um, so if you want to talk a little bit about your house rules, Luca. Oh, 
Uh, yeah. I've got house rules. It took me a while to compile them. Um, it was basically just a, every time something happened uh, in one of my games or in another game that I watched or played in, and I either liked or disliked how it went, I would basically just make a note in this document I had until I went through and just kind of like worded uh, how I wanted or like went out uh, onto Reddit to see how other DMs had like handled those problems. Um, and yeah, I just compiled them all into a single document and then published it as a web page. Um, I have a whole bunch of different rules, like house rules, like giving it your all, where you take uh, a level of exhaustion to make your attack a crit. Um, but I also like go over like gameplay and uh, my personal DMing style and how I would like player differences to be resolved at my tables. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of table and and conflict management built into the rules itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Saint, I know you like to use the uh, the kind of red card, green card, yellow card uh, thing during your mm -hmm. games. Are there any other uh, specific methods that you use either beforehand or um, I know that I I've read your. Uh, your kind of general rules to play at your table, um, but is there any any additions to your general rule set that you use? You know, there are, but they're not really written down right, right now. Like, th they are, but in a very, like, rough format. Mm -hmm. um, I, I basically, I I think that setting expectations is, is like, paramount in this conversation be before anything even starts. Right. So um, I think the, the biggest tool in a GM's arsenal in mine, definitely, uh, for those situations is just setting the expectation of how things are going to go, like with Luca Locke's house rules. And, um, you know, this is how I expect conflict resolution to happen at my table. Um, and I've basically I've applied I tend to apply a lot of the like restaurant manager, like philosophies that I've learned over the years and the experiences I've had from like breaking up fights in the middle of a Saturday night service at eight o'clock right. um, and just kind of apply it to the same, the same mode and like codifying that into a TTRPG setting is something that I'm currently working on, you know, so in all my free time. Yeah, right. So, but I do have a question about that, right? Um, Cause this is, this is something that's I think difficult to do, right? When you have, when you have players who are um, kind of, getting frustrated with like the choices of another player right and are coming into direct conflict of like the age old it's what's my character would do um yeah. what are like what is top of mind for you as a gm in like resolving that issue because i think that you know, comes I'm... into like to play more than any of us care to admit yeah i'll freely admit how much it comes into play it's all the time um i <sighs> top of my mind in those situations is uh, you know it's it's this is getting into the streaming versus home game thing it's a show not a stream it's a show not a game uh for all the things that i run so at the end of the day you know you don't go to a restaurant to watch your servers fight you don't go to um you know a, you know a coffee shop to watch the baristas bicker behind the counter you don't watch tv to watch the actors complain how someone else messed up their lines so setting that expectation of you know this is people are here to be entertained not to watch us argue over rules mm -hmm. and here is the very fast way we're going to get through it um i a lot of times will lose sight of what's happening at the table and i won't realize that it's getting there before it does um and then when it does it's back to that kind of restaurant mentality um there's a philosophy that uh, Danny Meyer uses, who runs Union Square Hospitality in New York City. Uh, wrote a great book about uh, running restaurants, but it's very applicable in any sort of managerial position or any sort of leadership position called setting the table. Um, he has a system of like fixing mistakes that I usually will apply to um, conflicts in games. Um, it's the five A's. One of them doesn't really apply to TTRPGs. 
Um, the first one is basically awareness, like knowing that there is a problem and being aware that you're getting to that point. Um, because if you are not aware, you are nowhere. Um, the second is acknowledging, like saying like, yes, this is happening right now and acknowledging that you understand what is happening. The third is apologizing, which I flip around to like, basically I try to make it state your case, state your case kind of thing. And then the fourth is act like state your case, state your case. This is what it is. Right. Accept it or not. Mm hmm. Uh, Luca, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Um, when it comes to the, it's what my character would do. I mean, first off, I try to encourage, like I have in my house rules, uh, don't undermine other party members. Uh, you know, don't, don't try and stop their actions or plans. Um, try and yes end as much as you can. But if you're going to disagree, like with what they're doing, do it in character um and uh you know say in character like oh i don't know if this is such a good idea we might all die i super don't want to do that like if they're trying to bust down a door and if they're insistent on it um let them uh let them but i mean your character doesn't have to go with them it's like yes i will let you do that and i'm going to stand over here and let you deal with the consequences um you know it's it's like we'll come back and heal you after we've dealt with what we're doing uh meanwhile enjoy being dead in that ditch right there uh we tried to warn you but keep it in character and like try and check in off screen um as much as possible and be like hey uh i know we're on screen like how you and i do when we're in altered carbon oh, our yeah. characters are very much kind of enemies like they're very antagonistic they're very towards... antagonistic right yeah but like mm -hmm. meanwhile we're like throwing insults each other and going full bitch mode but like meanwhile we're in discord like hey how you doing this is yep. totally just in character love you so much uh so it's it's like it's like okay we're just in character like hey my character thinks we're gonna die because of your actions but i love you and i'm here <laughs> to play with you mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I want to kind of dive into that real quick, uh, especially with an example of that uh, kind of off-screen mediating and exclamation. Um, with I, there's examples for for both of our guests, uh, but I want to start with Luca, and I want to start uh, by talking about the famous Xander uh, betrayal moment. Yeah. Uh, so uh i dark echo spoilers if you care <laughs> yes uh th this is going to hold some some spoilers for for dark echoes episode i don't know a 10 mm -hmm. or something like that 10 the and mask nine. is the name yeah. of the episode um and so this was a very tense moment uh everyone could feel it uh in the cast everyone could feel it in the chat uh what went into preparing for that um arguably one of the most kind of player versus player uh rp moments one of the heaviest moments we've had at tpk um i mean there's there's multiple multiple that i can think of right now but this one definitely was very striking what behind the scenes what 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 so went into that i planned this from day one like this was what i wanted to have happen in the campaign this is how i wanted you guys to meet this character um i first off i had turk read a whole book to prepare for this role i had him read i strahd which is the memoirs of strahd uh and his becoming of a vampire so like he both knew like he got to read from Strahd's point of view, like him entering Barovia, conquering it, and then his like obsession with Tatiana and his eventual turning uh, into a vampire uh, and becoming Lord of this land. So he had, he went into the character with all of that knowledge 
Uh, and the book actually does spend some time with him as Vasily, which in the module is the character that Turk was playing. We just changed the name for, uh, you know, player knowledge versus character knowledge. Um, <clears throat> and so he knew how to act uh, as this character. But uh, we were constantly texting or messaging on the side like okay so this moment is gonna bother you a lot if you want to like kind of crank up and we tried to slowly start out like very um friendly and personable and build relationships with all of you and then it would be like okay uh can you please dial up the uh the insanity a little like this mo like anytime arena like it was basically almost like harm points or like you know something like that it's like every time arena got hurt like he had a harder time uh, playing being cool. cool yeah yeah i would have him like we we're basically just slowly breaking that down um <clears throat> And so, like, there was a lot of, like, building with that. And then with Sarah, you have no knowledge of the campaign, so it was very difficult. So I basically was just like, so once upon a time, Strahd had a brother that this person, Tatiana, was engaged to and tried to give her the most bare bones history of the land. Uh, and I tried to give it to her separate of the other stuff so it wasn't like and now we're gonna talk about this uh but then i did let her know so next session or the next after that things are gonna get weird one of your fellow characters is going to start acting insane and like very antagonistic and i need you to know that it's on purpose because the way in which alexander kind of revealed himself was very you know strauds an incel He's a possessive incel. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, like, I know that kind of energy coming from someone else at the table, like, can be uh, very upsetting. So, I'm like, mm -hmm. Sarah, don't, don't worry. Turk's not losing his mind. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this is deliberate. And so, uh, and then when the moment actually ha happened, I felt very much like a director in a movie where I was like, I was literally feeding Turk lines from the book in case he'd forgotten them. Like, if you hit her with this, you know, and then I'd like hit up Sarah, like, okay, maybe like you're, you feel a little trusty. Okay, nope, nope, nope. And like, I'd try and direct her like, okay, no, you are not trusting this anymore. Please, uh, this is how you're feeling. Um, and then like, it was very much, okay, Turk, go. And I was like, okay, Sarah, it's happening. It's okay. Right. It's on purpose. Uh, it's totally within character. And I was just like messaging back and forth between them like crazy trying to manage and direct it, but also make sure that they knew it was all in character and only on the screen. Well, and one thing too, I think that's important too, that was checking like, are you okay? Like this is on purpose, but are you okay? Like. I think oftentimes, um, and I would love to talk about it because Saints got some roundhouse moments that I also think feed into mm -hmm. this as well, but it's that it's that as a GM, you're the connective tissue between the players. You're the one that's like giving the space, so it is a little bit your responsibility to make sure that that space is safe and that everything's cool. Like setting expectations beforehand, absolutely, but making sure that you're actively engaged and like, bro, you good? Like, bro, you good? Uh, and again, I think the same is true for home games, like, bro, you good? And there's nothing wrong with like slowing a situation down and saying, hey, we good? Like, I think that's really important. And it's something you don't really see with stream games because it is in discords. It is behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah you don't see much of it on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the example that I want to bring up for Saint and Sarah, I'm sure there's been, especially with your your characters this season, I'm sure there's been more kind of behind the scenes work. Um, but a classic that I want to bring up for, from Roundhouse Whitebridge uh, would be all of so Saint and I's uh, conversation behind um, the Philip episode after. Uh, I can't remember his name, but after Philip's like murder, 
uh, the episode directly after that. Um, and not only Saint and I kind of orchestrating, hey, you know, the character is kind of going in this direction. What can we do? How should I, you know, role play this? Mm -hmm. How do you want me to handle this? Um, yes, Stevie Jones, thank you, Purple. Um, poor Stevie. Um, but also when it got down to, you know, near the end when uh, some, you know, kind of tear jerking hard things were happening in the game, um, the, the entire cast in Discord and our, you know, DMs was checking in with each other to make sure everybody was okay. Um, and I will, I, I want to give um, Saint and Sarah a lot of credit uh, with that, specifically checking in during tense moments, because I know specifically you two do that a lot, uh, especially when there's conflict happening between players, especially when there's hard things happening, you know, be between GM and player, player versus player. So, um, Saint, I, we can talk a little bit about uh, what we did to kind of ease Philip into that villainous role, um, which kind of is the opposite of uh, what Luca and Turk did. Uh, kind of exactly. Um, more reactive. Yeah, more reactive. Um, but there's also, I'm sure, Sarah, you have a ton of uh examples from roundhouse that we could we could go into as well but saint when a player uh comes up to you and says hey this is what's happening with my character and this is where i think it 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 could be going you know how do you react to that and how do you incorporate those challenging topics into your games yes how can i help you get there exactly um, just doing that yes and kind of work. Um, and then building off of that, in your mind, how do you manage the other players' reactions to that? So I think it comes from knowing your players and paying attention. Uh, this kind of goes into that awareness piece from before right. about like knowing, first of all, the consent form that we talked about at the top of the show, like just knowing what could potentially be a trigger. I think I think the yellows on that form are far too often underutilized um, of things that, you know, you might not think it's gonna be an issue, but there's a chance if, it's, if it comes up in a random way that you're not expecting it could, mm -hmm. I think people should mark that a little bit more often. Um, but, but it comes down to, to saying yes and in that moment, hearing what the player wants to do or what the player's thinking and then trying to like bounce that against the other players in your head it's it's really it's it's as, as simple as that and it's as hard as that do you know what i mean yeah absolutely like, i think like just no go ahead no i was gonna say i there's several examples from morningstar that i would love for you to go into right because i as someone who sits at your table i think you oftentimes like this is a space that you actively play in where you're not pitting the characters against each other, but you are creating like dynamics between them where their interests might not align, right? And I want like sure talk to us about that a little bit because I, as a player, it's super like meaningful to be a part of. But I would love to hear it from the GM perspective. Uh, sure, it's interesting. It's I think that a lot of times with like with home games, it's whatever you want it to be. It's you want to kill things, you want to slash, you want to be murder hobos. That's fine. With stream games, it it seems to me like it needs to be more of a composed piece, even though there is a lot of elements of improv mixed in there. And so there is. So what's a good way to put this? It's it's. It's on the spot character development where like the players might not necessarily have had time or felt like motivated to give you like this fully detailed seven to nine page backstory of every trauma they've ever experienced, every success they've ever experienced. Um, it kind of forces players in a, in I think a positive way. I like to think a positive way to 
make a decision about where your character stands in life on the fly and then defend it. And I try to look at what people have given me and see like two different things I can kind of put at each other. And then I just play and see what sticks to the wall. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's the challenging piece of like GMing, right? Is like it is like you're role playing, you're yes anding, it's improv. You can absolutely create moments like Luca where you're like from the jump, you are laying groundwork, you're working behind the scenes, you're doing it. But sometimes these moments can happen like just out of nowhere right like it's a, it's a yellow card situation or even a red card situation or like the players just straight up don't just dis don't agree like they just don't uh and making sure that doesn't get in the way of the game and the fun uh i think is the mark of a good gm turning it and like threading it back into the narrative to push them forward rather than than stall uh everything I, I will say to ty's to ty's example from earlier too uh, Monster of the Week and just Powered by the Apocalypse in general is a very difficult system to do that with because of how much agency the players have to create and just like left turn on, on, a, on a dime. Um, so actually part of the driving force behind Season 2 is exploring that. Um, it's kind of exploring like player agency and choices and like what what will what will both the character and the player do which i can say that now that there's been kind of the fourth wall taken away from some of the characters like what are the choices the player and the character would make in this moment mm -hmm. right uh, and that kind of uh sorry sir no you're that good. kind of um that kind of breaking away from the fourth wall that you get with um monster of the week and also you know specifically roundhouse the second season it kind of creates this this interesting lack of what the the negative side of what would my character do and is more of a okay we have an informed decision to make mm -hmm. based off of what i would do as as the player who is in the game um but also still kind of considering what the character would do but in a more, I, I believe in a more uh, substantial and positive way. And I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. I do think the term, what would my, what my character would do is often used in a negative connotation. Um, it's a very defensive at, statement. It's a very right. defensive statement. Like you're already yes. kind of like coming in saying, you can't you can't argue with my creative choice. It's what my character would do. Like it's right. it's already kind of throwing not, up a shield. I'm not trying to be an asshole, but nope, you're about to be an asshole. Right. right. Yeah. But I do think I do think the the idea of playing true to your character is separate from that. Yeah. Um, because especially on screen, we are acting and we, we need to make sure that we're keeping <laughs> in most of our shows at least a semblance of content. Um, <laughs> um, and maintaining that kind of okay, this is uh, well, like like how Saint said earlier, you know, give them a little bit of time to reflect on where the character is in life and how they would you know react to that, defend that stance. Um, I think that is probably the better way to look at playing the character instead of hey, I'm making this decision and. I'm being pig-headed because, like, oh, I have an edgy backstory kind of thing. You know, I think there's a, I think there's an, in, there's a way that I feel like I tend to do it, and it's kind of like a DM like meme, of like the, are you sure you want to do this kind of thing. Right. So when those moments come up, I will very clearly restate my understanding of what it is they want to do in as much detail as possible. Right. And then say, are you sure this is what you want to do? which first of all raises the freaking flag for all the other yeah. players like hey this is about to be a conflict mm -hmm. um second of all makes them make a conscious choice to do it and if at right. that point it then goes into i'm just being an asshole character uh, player not an asshole character because like some characters are assholes some people want to play that character and that character works 
if everybody is on the same page and communicating about right. what that dynamic is. Mm -hmm. right. right. Um, and to be honest, if the asshole character is willing to leave the party at some point, like yeah. if the player mm -hmm. is willing to like part ways. Or change. Or, or, or change, change right. and grow. Yeah. Right. But like if it if it crosses that line beyond that like second confirmation that you want to do this, then we're having words and there's a very solid chance you will not be at the table the next session. Right. Yeah. Thankfully I've never had to go that far. I well, this one the of time... the things Oh go for it. Oh. I was just gonna ask you a question, Luca, but go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just I was gonna say one of the things I do or try to do as often as I can is when I am as a player about to do something that I think will result in a conflict or might, you know, I will I either message in Discord or like out of character, hey, uh, guys, I am thinking of doing this thing. Or even in character, I am walking towards this or clearly with the intention of opening it, even though we don't know what's beyond it, uh, you know, because of some character motivation. And then I will like pause and just kind of like, is anyone reacting or saying anything? Cause like, this is her intention. And I try and give other players, cause like, I want to play my character, but I never want to do so in a way that sacrifices, makes other players have to sacrifice their character for mine. And so I try and give them like, this is what I am doing in character because of these character motivations, I'm going to do this thing. And then I try and give them like a space to either say something to my character or move to stop me or, you know, cause like, it's not like I'm not unreasonable, but uh, I am going to do this thing unless someone says something that makes sense, you know, for yeah. me to stop or, Absolutely. you know, like I try and this is what my character would do. Right. I think I'm going to do it. Does think... anyone want to? Yeah, Give yeah. Me a different idea. Right. I think one thing with with uh playing TTRPGs is there's like a I don't know where it came from, but I know that I experienced this as there's the fear of the meta. Like mm. the fear that if I as the player step out and talk to my other players and say this is what I'm thinking or this is what I'm doing, that it's somehow going to like break the game or make it less interesting, less dynamic, less whatever. And that simply isn't true in my opinion. Like I I honestly think those meta choices of like stopping and saying to saint's point hey this is the decision you're gonna make like you are full stopping you are analyzing uh and taking the time to do that is really important and like a part of the ttrpg experience i think there's a lot of pressure from like especially in the streaming space or even in the home game space to like tell the most epic story ever and like you can't do that if you step outside the narrative but i think it's because you can step outside the narrative and make sure like you set this up exactly how you want to that that makes those moments more meaningful and i really appreciate like what you're saying there is like giving space for that collaborate because that's where the collaboration happens right like that's where you actually get to tell the story together instead of just mm -hmm. it's what my character would do i'm taking this action that impacts the party blah 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 yeah there's two things i want to tack onto that real yeah. fast one um i think the fear of the meta it's it comes from tyrannical dms honestly um and the way that i kind of uh try to mitigate that is to me like rules lawyering aside that's a whole other beast that correct constant correct freaking ire of mine um but like the metagaming thing as long as your character never act on what a the player knows that's that's, that's really it that's all the it line is. right there that's really all it is mm -hmm. so you can yeah. have like I, I encourage you to have as many meta conversations as you want but the second your character acts on information that the character doesn't have but the player has i'm gonna have a problem with it Mm -hmm. um, the second point I wanted to add on to that was, um, you know, I think that because we at this table and a lot of the people watching uh, are doing this in a streaming space and are doing this as a live show, we kind of have a responsibility and an obligation to have those conversations out loud. Yes. So that it sets an example for other people and it sets a standard like, hey, it's not cool to do this at your table. You need to have consent. You need to have communication. You need to like think about mm -hmm. other players and other players' characters when mm -hmm. you're making choices like this. 
absolutely because i think it's again it's i a lot of, i think of like I think a lot of people sit down to play D&D anymore in this space and they're like, it's going to be like Critical Role or it's going to be like The Adventure Zone or it's going to be like, you know, big streamed shows. Uh, and when they don't have that experience, like that drives like you like you don't want to have traumatizing experiences and you have to communicate about that and you have to communicate that as people right like there's so much stuff that you can do in the beforehand but making space for those character interactions like on stream where players are talking to players not characters talking to characters because at the end of the day it's a game like <laughs> these are choices yeah, that yeah. human beings are making uh not necessarily all within the space of the mind one thing really quick because we're uh because i don't want to get past it because it goes along that with the fear of the meta there's also this like I want to tell the most amazing yes, cool about... story my character is the coolest character that ever charactered and like here's the thing as a GM I'm super here for it like absolutely 100%. tell me how dope your character is but I want to ask everyone here like you have I mean your tables can be two to six players you know what I mean you got a, you have a lot of people bringing their coolest characters and their coolest ideas into a narrative that you're building that's a lot to balance. Um, so talk to me about how you do that. Handling spoilers or surprises, reveals in a way that is respectful to the players who like it belongs to without diminishing the experience of the others or the narrative. Can I go first, Luca? No, you go first. <laughs> um, first of all, I agree, and I love when people are like, this is how awesome my character is. This is a, the story that I want to bring to the table. However, you tell that to me as a DM, and my mouth starts watering. Because I am, I'm, it's just me, it's my table. I'm going to break your character. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to find a, I'm going to find a way to question, for you to question everything that you have, just because I think that's a very interesting thing. Like, I don't understand the dynamic of somebody being that into their character. So like it create it's it's an opportunity for me to tell a better story using your story. Mm -hmm. That sounds less asshole -ish than what I just said in the first place. That's what I meant. That last part. <laughs> Go with that. Um I mean so like it is possible to tell whatever story you want to tell, no matter what your characters bring to the table, your players bring to the table. Period. And I personally think that the stories that we tell at the table are better because there are four, five, six, seven people telling it. And so I personally will just sacrifice entire narratives if the character or the player has a much better choice that's more interesting, that is more in line with the story they want to tell. However, I also want to double up on... Um, kind of well not double up on i also want to point out that like sharing the spotlight is an important thing too and ha making sure that the players are allowing the other players to have their time in the spotlight mm -hmm. which is difficult to manage with some tables absolutely yeah. that's my two cents luca hit me with that um well so like as a player i do it by like giving that space Right. I, you know, I've shown up with a character with a story to tell, or at least a story that I think I want to tell. Usually by the end of it, I'm telling a much different story than I set out to tell. Yes. But like by giving that pause, you know, giving that space for uh, the other players to tell the story with me. And then it's not just me showing up like, here is my story. Let me just, I'm telling you, I'm telling my story at you and you have to listen. It's very much no we're telling a story together so i'm gonna give Wick. that space Wick. for them to influence my character and my character's decisions and then we're telling a story together because no matter how much i really want to tell my story like ultimately i end up with a better story when we tell it together and they actually like challenge my character or make me think different decisions or you know, sometimes I go ahead with the decision anyways, but it's like there's fallout and then we have to deal with that, like within the story. It's like conflict that arises narratively. Um, but as a DM, uh, sharing the spotlight around, and sometimes that can be more difficult because there are definitely some players that give you more to work with. 
uh, than others. And it's not one is better than the others. It's just some players really do like to come and tell the story together, but aren't looking to be a front man uh, of the band, so to speak. So it's, it's sometimes it's like I, I want to give everyone uh, shared space, but a little time, uh, you know, it is like, come on, come out here. We're telling a story together. Um, but yeah, rotating the spotlight around uh, helps a lot with that. Um, and just trying to figure out how to weave in the characters' choices and backstories into my narrative. Like, I mean, I say this all the time about Harper season one, the entire last half of the campaign, I abandoned all plans I had because of mm -hmm. the choices that the characters were making. Uh, Lady Lich was just uh, thought up on the spot after Nicholas, the character, said he wanted to try and destroy that phylactery. And it's like, well, what if they go into the phylactery and then they meet a lich? And then she was like, there was that moment and how that all went down. It's like, oh, she's involved now. And they're like, we've got to find her, you know, and we've got to right. go do all this stuff. And they like made all these choices. And as a result, they got... <laughs> They got a, a, a Mind Flayer and a, a Litha Lich to come and help them defeat a cult. It, the, you know, it, right. the story ended up so much cooler. I still ended up where I wanted with the 50-foot bikini werewolf um, as the end event. And my my Buffy sacrifice of like, you know, all I still had the moments that I had planned from day one. But so much more than I could have ever told on my own and it was because we were all telling the story together you guys really just wrote that last half of that campaign for me like with your choices and i was just like laying track uh as quickly as i could ahead of you guys trying to keep up yeah i think something you said it's telling a story at versus telling a story with right yeah. and making sure that we're constantly emphasizing that at our tables right like I think oftentimes it can be challenging to like uh, give up the spotlight, you know what I mean? Or like if you want to tell a story, there are other ways to do it and reminding people like that there are other options. Like if you if this if this narrative about this character is so, so important uh, that it needs to be exactly how you perceive it and exactly the way that you want it to go, regardless of other input you should you should write a story you should write you should take that energy and put it to a different medium would be lays my suggestion right like because this is a collaborative Absolutely. like totally different medium for that correct correct it's like you can i would i would say like from my experience if you're coming in and you're saying no like i had a difficult interaction with a player where he my player was very adamant like this is who my character is this is what they're going to do and this is how they're going to respond to every situation. And the only way that that's going to be like the only thing you, the GM, can do is kill him. Like mm -hmm. it was like an ultimatum. Like this is like it. I'm not willing to compromise. I'm not willing to go there. I'm not willing to do any of the things. And it's like, well, then then we can't play. There's no You're not there. here to tell the story with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I think it's important for <clears throat> as as the the GM's, you know, story written story or you know story that's evolving is malleable and flexible to whatever the players are doing um i also think it's important for all of the players and their characters specifically to be as malleable as as the gm is being um in order to do that the the thing that really stands out to me is is your character growing and changing with every passing session is your character evolving to meet the needs of the party? Is your character evolving to fit the pace of the storytelling and the, and the, the storytelling of the people around it? Um, and if the answer is no, then you need to work on that. And that's, that's how you're going to share the spotlight. That's how you're going to create a cohesive, beautiful story with the people around you. Um, and if that's, if, your character is getting that then um exactly what sarah said we we can't really play like if your character is just going to be sitting there and 
um, death driftering while the rest of the party is, you know, trying to craft this beautiful piece of story, I would guarantee that most GMs are not going to put up with that. Um, and most players are not going to like it. And honestly, if the if the storytelling is that good, I guarantee that the characters are not going to put up with that character for very long either. Um, and when something like that happens, um, and I don't know if I want to call this a player or a character coup or a player coup. Um, mutiny. <laughs> a mutiny, yes. Uh, how, how would all of you handle something like that? If multiple players or multiple characters started to kind of gather arms against another uh how do you react in that situation do you stop the session and discuss it off stream do you let things play out narratively how how would you handle that uh, I see it would Saint, depend like, on smirking. <laughs> how it's going down, right? Are they keeping it within character? Are we talking off screen and saying, hey, is everyone okay? Is this right. in character? It would very much depend because I've had that happen uh, because a player was very much, this is what my character would do and I will not listen to any other, you know. And I had the entire rest of the party arguing with him uh, and it was very much like off screen. I was like, can we move on from this? And the player and the character were very obstinate. So there was a lot of tension. Uh, and afterwards we just had to have like talk during downtime where it's like, and it's part of why I formed uh, one of my rules, which is keep the party in mind. Um, I like, I get, I get asked a lot with Harper's because everyone brings new characters. Uh, can I create an evil aligned character? Uh, you know, because they get to test everything out a lot of times in Harper's. And I always tell them <laughs> rule number nine, keep the party in mind. Uh, you know, if you're going to create an evil aligned character, I need you to come up with a reason why this party and their success and well-being truly matters to your character. And I don't care, like, either as a whole or each individually, like, they, like, their success and survival matters to your character. Whether it serves your selfish interests later on via backstory or furthers your, your goals of dominion over the world or, you know, whatever. You just need to make sure that they all succeed. Uh, you are part of the team. Um, and I always tell them, you know, like... Uh, creating a character with a complex backstory uh, and crazy motivations is super exciting. But if that personality uh, that seems to spring forth from that character is one that cannot be a team player, uh, make a different character. Because we're here to tell a story together. So right. if, make them evil. Sure, that's their backstory. Maybe they need these play people. Play the asshole character. Yeah, absolutely. But play with the party. Mm -hmm. That's my one thing. So like, I had to have like a conversation after that session. It was like, if you cannot play with the party, telling a story together, rather than just forcing your character on everyone else and forcing them to sacrifice their characters for yours, then this is not going to work because that is not the type of table I want to have. Mm -hmm. Right. Hit me with it, Saint. Hit me with it, Saint. I got two know. answers. Go. Two answers. One, um, if it came up organically and it was like I wasn't prepared for the moment where a character is being, one player slash character is being stubborn and the rest of the party decides we've had enough of this. If it came up immediately, I would first of all check in with the one player and like, is this the narrative that you want to go? Because this is about to turn PvP. And if you want to go there, I'm going to let it. The other option, if I know that it is uh, player dynamics clashing that has led to this situation, first of all, I will be disappointed in myself because that means I failed. Um, like in mediating and, and trying to stop it from getting to this point. But when it turns, I'd have the same question. 
are you sure you want to go here? Because this is about to turn PvP. And then when it does, we're going full on. Mm -hmm. Like, this is now about this dynamic, and it's probably not going to stop until one side's dead. We got to resolve this, right? Like, yeah. there, are some, there are some conflicts. Like, you can't continue on. There's got to be something there. Like, a, a something. Here's where the smirk came in. Um, I will do, in that particular moment, It, if it gets to that point, in my opinion, it is clear this player is not going to play for the group. Mm. Because if I've given you the choice, knowing all the past and saying like, hey, they're all against you. Are you sure you want to do this? As a DM, I'm going to do everything I can to kill that character. Mm, interesting. Um because I feel like my answer is a little different. Uh, when it like, if you sit at my table, I have like my little like my home rules. I send you a thing, and I'm like, here's the blah blah blah. Respect and fun. I have. If we're not having fun, like if it's if it's stop being fun, I have no problem calling it done, closing it down. It's a game. Yeah. It's a, like that's what we're here to do. We're here to tell a story. We're here to play a game. And if there's no fun, it's not worth it. So my like my expectation is for myself. If I get the sense that people are no longer enjoying themselves, there's nothing for it. Like zero problem, shutting it down, intermission screen, whatever, I don't care, mm -hmm. like we're done. Um, as a GM, I think, again, like the fear of the meta or whatever, like one of my huge things that I love to do is leverage NPCs uh, to act as like a balancing kind of like mediating factor, like using, using all the GM tools and the toolkit right like if if a player starts to like be a dick or you know like is like or if like the party is ganging up on like a, a particular person whether it's choices or whatever blah 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 depending on like what i perceive... well, I need to amend something real fast i'm oh, so sorry it. yeah if it's if it is the party ganging up on one player uh same thing but flipped mm -hmm. like i won't right. let a, the party just gang up right. on one player unresponded right. sorry i need that to be said no of course of course it's about respect right uh, and I, like, I freaking love, like, NPCs, like, coming in, like, opening the door and being like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, and kind of, like, introducing the meta <laughs> into the narrative and, like, really making people step back and be like, whoa, what is this? Why are we doing this? Um, and, like, really leveraging that tool. Because I think a lot of times GMs think that, like, oh, the players are interacting, so I have to, like, sit back and let this play out. No, 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 my dude. You are the connective tissue between those players. Get in there. Involve yourself. Like, straight up, make an NPC on the fly that just pops out of a magic portal. And it's like, what the fuck's going on here, bros? Like, you are you are in control of this world. There is no reason that you can't, like, interject to help, like, resolve the conflict. Whether that's through meta narrative, in character na narrative, shutting it down, whatever. Like, that, that would be my response, right? Uh, but also, like, hey, players, don't pick on your other players. <laughs> just just don't. Just don't. If you got a problem, <laughs> resolve it outside of game. Like, or, or to Luca's point, like, it shouldn't escalate to a point where you're right. like, mm, bruh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, my intent when asking, hey, you know, if you're, if you're a group of players, you know, is it attacking another player? It's more, more like... Uh, hey, I'm fed up with your shit kind of thing. Uh, less bullying, which seemed to be what was just talked about, or at least that's the impression I got, it's, was like a bullying It's more like sense. that, like, it's a fine line, right? Because right. I think it's like the perception of the action can oftentimes, yeah. like, get in the way. Like, maybe that's not intended, but that's what happens. Right. Assume positive intent, but I think oftentimes, like, you're the GM, yeah. you're choosing to manage uh the table and because of that like sorry sorry not sorry but that's the job that's the gig is yeah, like and managing awkward interactions i think the idea of like the the really empathetic guard that just randomly appears in the middle of the street while the the players are having this heated conversation being like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. what's going on here let's talk about your side let's talk about your side i think that's a really cool idea um I have to ask a question to that, though. I like the idea in theory, but how does that... Does that theory actually solve anything with a player who has a history and track record of pushing this particular envelope? Like, an NPC's... 
how how is that going to change anything and i think I, that's why i took like this i take a stronger stance on it it's like mm -hmm. this is not acceptable we're gonna have this out it's gonna be a great moment and then have a nice day yeah no i think i totally agree and i think to your point saint like if it's a repeated behavior i got no problem like and we're done like yeah. I know it sucks, especially like as a GM, you, you've done all this prep and you want to do this cool story and everybody brought snacks and you're sitting at the table and it's a good time. But like, if it's not fun, it's not worth it. If it's not about respect, it's not worth it. Like it just isn't. Give yourself space to be like, this isn't cool and leave. Yeah, I agree. Well, uh, hey. we're, yeah, we're coming up on an hour. Uh, yeah. so, perfect, so I think we should take a break um and uh chat uh love to hear like if you have questions in this space or comments or whatever hit us uh with them during break uh that would be phenomenal and then uh when we come back i want to talk a little bit of like conflict m with mechanics uh i'm looking at you charm spell uh so we're going to talk about some of that stuff uh when we get back so go go refill your coffee uh do some light yoga and we will be right back We're back. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hey. Uh, we have talked a lot about uh, like back seat, uh, making sure everyone is fine off screen. Um, and we've talked a little bit about how we would handle difficult players and characters. I don't like what you're saying, Ty. I'm going to cast Charm on you. Make me a wisdom save. <laughs> Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, okay, so. Sarah, I'm actually going to stop you right there. <laughs> Hi. Uh, is this something that you are okay with having done to your character? You know what, Luca? That is a that is an interesting question. Um, it depends. It depends on the circumstance for me. Um, but I know... What your intentions are with this charm against Ty's character? I just feel like it. <laughs> No. Hey, I'm it's actually what my going character to would disallow do. that. Uh, your charm uh, spell fails to go off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't try that shit again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is your one thing. <laughs> but let's talk, let's talk about it, though. Sorry, Ty. Continue. <laughs> no, exactly. No, this is exactly what I want to talk about, is uh, problematic mechanics getting in the way of our storytelling. Um, getting and, in you the know, way of we respect. Talk, and in the way of respect, exactly. And we talk a lot about the rule of cool. Right, and we we talk about rules, lawyering, and whatnot. Um, what we don't talk a lot about is situations where rules can be very detrimental to the storytelling and the sense of making our players and our characters feel uh, hopeless or feel like they don't have the ability or the the like sentience to do anything one of those spells being charms uh in dnd charms against other players can result in some pretty uh contentious content uh, and feelings um and uh, let's let's just talk about charms real quick uh Luca, you kind of gave us your example of how you would handle a uh, a player trying to charm another player. Um, I I would like to kind of dive a little bit more into that, and if you would give us a a kind of step by step uh, depiction of how you would work through that scene, but also um, how would you handle uh, a player reacting in a kind of negatively visceral way to uh their player being charmed by a npc or a monster um how would you handle something like that well first off uh that's what the consent form is for right um i once uh had a player say that they do not like uh any spell that paralyzes they had issue with that and so i was like okay does this include uh, because I knew what was coming up that session. Does this include things like hold person? And they, yes. And so that session, any spell that restrained didn't exist. I just told all of my players, this spell does not exist this session. Any spells that have this effect do not exist this session. 
uh, and all of my baddies that had effects that would do that just doesn't exist anymore for that session so that uh, that player could feel comfortable and safe. Right. So answer number one is that's what the consent form is for. If I know a player is uncomfortable with being charmed by an NPC, it's not going to happen. Um, but, you know, I even have it like on my page, like sometimes things get forgotten. So if that were to happen and I were to cast charm on a player and they were, hey, I'm uncomfortable with this. Okay, we're in a pull back. We're in a stop. Do you need a minute? Put on the intermission screen like Chrissy was saying, like we're on a streamed game. You can switch to that intermission screen. People can wait while you guys sort things out so everyone feels safe. Like their safety does not come over, like come uh, get sacrificed by like chat watching. Right. And um, I imagine, I imagine it would be very a very similar situation if um, a a player maybe put green light on their consent form, uh, but in session discovered, hey. I didn't know this was a trigger for me, but uh, this is something very good. I imagine you would handle it somewhat simply. Yeah. Well, and I, I try and tell everyone that plays at my table, like, it's possible that things get missed or forgotten, or you didn't know that thing was going to upset you. It Like, and I'll even tell them, because, like, sometimes when you're managing a stream and DMing, you're not always able to, like, I know Saint does the red card system, like, hold up a red item. I can't, I know I, my limitations as a DM that's also streaming the game, I can't rely on that because it may be ages. Like I have this fear that it'll be ages before I see that they're holding up this thing. And then, you know, so I have it step away from your chair. Like it happens all the time. Like Cole will like leave his chair to like go pee or something really quick while other players are having a moment. It's like step away from your chair. If it comes back around to your term and I haven't noticed that you've stepped away yet, we will deal with it then. It's like, oh, they've stepped away. We'll go to intermission. And then they can come back to their chair. We can be like, hey, are you okay? You stepped away. Was it just like you need to use the restroom or like you struggling? And we can talk it out there during intermission where they don't feel the pressure of being on screen. So right. I always tell them like, if something was missed or you suddenly feel uncomfortable, just get up and walk away. And like, I'll notice that you're gone and we can deal with it there. We can cool things down. We can walk things back. You know, we can, even if it's too much, we can wrap things up. It, it's, I'm not going to no. the show must go on. Damn your safety. Like it's, that's not what it's about. Right. Same. Uh, yeah. Uh, Specifically, what would you like me to talk about? Because there's a lot to unpack right now. Oh, there's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> so what much. I would, I would, so let's talk. Let's talk. Uh, I mean, PvP mechanics, right? Like mm -hmm. your player uh, wants to steal something from another player, or wants to lie about something, to, or, to, or or use a, a controlling spell like charm. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, what works at your table? What doesn't? The short answer is anything can work at my table with clear communication and with proper intent. Um, the first question, just like what Luca said, is like, what's your intent for doing this? Like yes. when Luca asked you, Sarah, like, why are I you doing it. this? I love because that. Because sometimes it it's good for the story and everybody's on board with it. I think it's I think it's a table dynamic thing, like I'm very careful about who I play with when I'm running the game. And so I try my best to make sure that the, as much as like you've, like I think all three of you have said to me that you very much like trust certain things at my table because you know it'll be handled respectfully and it'll be handled safely. Mm -hmm. I try to pick players that I know would also do that for each other. And so yes. I very rarely, I think, I mean, somebody that's in one of my campaigns can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I, I don't think I've ever had a situation where that's happened. Or if it has happened where it's been contentious. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, the intent piece is, is remarkable because I think sometimes players forget that they're there to play their character and it can be very like 
alluring or tempting to try and play someone else's character if they're not doing something that you don't like and using mechanics to leverage your ability to like I don't like your choice I'm going to use mechanics to leverage that I agree like playing with people choosing your parties your your players your GMs and being informed about who you're going to play with will better mm -hmm. leverage that but I think oftentimes like like let's just talk about how it is right it's like uh i i'm going to exert control over your character through mechanics so you can't fight with me because it's how the game works like i think sometimes players can mm -hmm. slip into that i mean Absolutely. i i hate to say this but why is that person at your table that's a fair question sometimes you don't know that person is that person until they sure reveal themselves to be that person yeah no absolutely and i, I definitely get that and i understand that but um also uh, in personal experience some people genuinely don't understand uh that bit uh they're new to things uh there's a lot of people that come new to like if you play with new players like i have they don't really know they're like can use it here's the spell it works like this let's do it uh they don't really think outside themselves of like how charming another character takes away like you're basically saying you don't get to play anymore i'm playing your character and my character uh you know they don't really think about that they're caught up in the this is the game these are the rules i am playing the rules this is like video game right uh video game brain. and yeah and they don't really because they're new to the system to playing mm. at a table i don't i don't um, buy that i don't buy that that's it to me that sounds the same as well, I shouldn't be held accountable for breaking the law because I didn't know it was a law. Well, so here's the difference, though, is that when this happens uh, and someone's like, I am new, I had no idea, you still hold them accountable. It's like, that's sure. great. Uh, here's what you did wrong, why it's wrong. Don't do it again. Uh, you are new, but now you've learned. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, and I've, like I said, I've, I, because you've leveled I... leveled up. <laughs> yeah, because I've because I've been so picky about my players, I think I've done myself a disservice by not having that experience mm -hmm. so that I know how to properly handle it and I know how to like navigate that situation that you're describing. Because like yeah. on the surface, hearing the story, it just seems like, well, that person doesn't play well with others. And that's not kind of somebody I want to play with. But I can see now that there is definitely... There are definitely circumstances and like situations that it would just be mm -hmm. innocent ignorance, not just willful ignorance. Yeah. Right. And it kind of, uh, it's not necessarily a PVP or a rules mechanic kind of thing, but I, I, will, I will be the first to say that I have in the past, even recently had problems with interjecting myself uh into other players turns uh not necessarily because i you know want to be a dick but because i think oh hey you know maybe i can add a little flair to this maybe i can help this player out this character's turn out blah 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 um and you know it, it was, it's been brought to my attention that that takes the spotlight off of that character when that character is having you know their spotlight moment. and so i've been and it's one of the reasons why i've been trying to have such a, a backseat uh, kind of role in um, the new Roundhouse season two, it, and uh, it's kind of the reason why I've been a little more back, so that you know new players can get more of a spotlight. Um, but it's it's a continuous uh, to Lucas. It's a continuous like, hey, this is the problematic behavior that I have, I have seen from you. Please fix it, and then. If they fix it, amazing. These are the players that you want to work with. If they don't fix it, then it's more than just ignorance. Yeah, if they don't fix it or refuse to admit there's a problem, then you know right away, okay, this person is not someone I want to be at the table with. That's yeah. an easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> you got your answer and it was easy. Um, but yeah, if some, like, it doesn't happen a lot. A lot of times, they are just willfully ignorant but every once in a while i have come across where they were just genuinely uh innocently ignorant they didn't know that they were making a mistake uh they were playing with video game brain 
Yeah. Uh, and that's that's a, an easy fix if they are willing to change sure. and yeah. learn. And it I think back to, oh, I was gonna say it please. goes back to that kind of manager uh, mentality of like disciplining someone, um, where it's like this is this is where we are, this is where we need to be, this is how you're gonna get there, and if you don't get there, here's the consequence. Right. Like just laying it out. Like this is unacceptable. This is what you mm -hmm. need to do. How can I help you get there? If you don't, we're probably gonna have to part ways. Yeah. Yep. And I think a lot of this can be dealt with, uh, you know, pre-session, all of our our conversations and our expectations. Yep. Um, for me specifically, my my problem lies in I get very um, war brain when it comes to combat. Uh, very strategic try to be the be the, the smartest one be the the strategic mind and try to control the battlefield as much as i can um until it was brought up to me i didn't realize that that harms the narrative because it's not letting these other players have these these shiny moments so um it actually happened in one of lucas sessions she told me that hey you know failing is not always a bad thing you know, sometimes it creates a beautiful story. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's very important. Again, the number one thing when dealing with a- Guys, putting me on blast, just literally just airing every time I've told him how to be a better player at my table. <laughs> just but, very recently, I was told by Luca how listen, much I needed to- Listen, but this is a, these are conversations that are pertinent and need to happen. I know. Right? Because I'm if we're not right here, <laughs> if we're not sitting, if we're not sitting around, then I commend you for these conversations because <laughs> it it takes a DM that wants the party and the players to grow, to change, and become better players and better teammates. If those conversations aren't had, then there's no way for those players to you know get better. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's my biggest thing is when dealing with a problematic player uh try just try to inform them enlighten them it's interesting <sighs> you said like problematic player i would even tweak that to say problematic behavior right, right. because i think yeah. a lot of times like sitting at tables like it's like i think about like the defensiveness that can come in like we're being creative is being vulnerable like mm -hmm. when you're when you're truly coming to a table and saying here are my ideas and here's what I'm trying to do, you're being vulnerable. And when somebody's like, I don't like that idea, it can be like 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 you know like it's what my character would do, like ah like backing up and like I think it's important like for everyone to feel safe. Like yes, 100%. I'm not going to deny there are problematic players, there are problematic GM, there are problematic people. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> starting with like a hey, this behavior is not okay. And like, I think it goes back to what Saint said, like this behavior is not okay. Are you still going to commit to this course of action, right? Like, or are you going to repeat this course of action, right? Like making sure that we're assigning, like identifying the actual problem and not being like, hey, you suck, get it? Like, like it's giving the opportunity for people to be better, <laughs> right? Like yeah. it's, it's important. Yeah, and I think it's it's our it's our responsibility as GMs at the table. Like you had mentioned before, Sarah, like this is what we signed up for. Like we are managing this, we are running this. It's our responsibility to have the hard conversation, no matter whatever you want to or not. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And that's my thing. If you're not willing to, if you're not willing to, that's acceptable. But I would argue you shouldn't run the game. Like yeah. you should just yeah. you should just can't. Agreed. Like you, if you don't like, if you're not willing to like engage in respectful dialogue about what it means to like be safe that's okay just <clears throat> just maybe don't run a game where you're trying to like push these concepts and ideas right like it goes back to that like i want to tell the most epic story ever like everybody wants to we all want to have those like cool surprise moments where we like shock and awe and like ah like because that's what makes it fun but if it's not fun it's not worth it and if you're not going to be respectful about it it's it's not worth it um i want to tag you in here have to too. have fun without uh, ruining other people's fun. Right, yeah. right. Um, one thing I want to tack in here, because, like, I think we've all, like, it seems like collectively, like, around charm, it feels like we're all, uh, our opinions of this rule as GMs is that um, cool if, like, other player says it's cool. Like, are there, are there 
mechanics or rules that you're just like hard no at my table like this is something and like if so um why yes um uh in my consent form uh i have it where it is very firmly stated that sexual assault does not happen in my world yes it just doesn't uh it is not something like i said where that day that spell doesn't exist sexual assault does not exist in my version of the forgotten realms or whatever system i'm running i i've told players like if they want it in their backstory as like a compelling thing that changed who their character is that's fine if i clear it with the rest of the players before they ever talk about it with the other characters and like discuss it on screen mm -hmm. uh but other than that it's not gonna happen it's never gonna happen from an npc it's never gonna happen between players it just doesn't exist mm -hmm. Uh, for me, uh, a little. Uh, oh, uh, go for it, Saint. Go for it, Saint. No, no, no. Go. A little bit on the lighter side. Uh, for me, <laughs> I don't let. I don't like letting players roll persuasion checks on each other. Persuade them in RP. Um, insight, sure. Uh, insight and deception, sure. But I don't like the idea of like persuading or intimidating someone like through the mechanics. Like I, I would much rather them manage that through RP than like an npc sure like that's fine but to like pvp that kind of stuff mm -mm. not not for me fam because it feels very much like i'm going to force you uh to do this thing because i rolled higher than you um gr but again it goes back to intent yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. i think uh so i don't have i have, I have like three basic like if you follow none of my other rules, these are the three that you need to follow. Um, but I need to, and I, like everyone, learn as we go along. I need to have more things like Luca said. Like, there needs to be hard limits, especially for stuff like that. Because, again, I've done myself a disservice by picking the players I've picked. Where I'm, I'm, in, I'm not putting myself in a situation where I even think this is a possibility, and I'm that. going to get blindsided, and Perhaps. I recognize that. Perhaps. At some but point. Just run more new player one shots or <laughs> uh, rotating one shots with a cast that comes in and out. Uh, it'll, it'll make you level up as a GM mm. very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> but this I is def I, like... I, I definitely need go for to. it. Go for it. No, I love it because like it, it, it responds more like to the home game too, right? You you have selected a group of friends that you're gonna sit around and do this thing. Like that's you have chosen the people you're gonna tell the story with. Like, awesome. Just level set on what that story is. I see no problem with it at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, the three rules that I have, uh rules lawyering, it just should not yeah. happen on a stream. Yep. I don't care if you have a like if it's game breaking or if it will change the outcome, I'm okay with you speaking up. Otherwise, I'm just gonna go with whatever I went with and I try to cut it down as quickly as possible. It is a very big challenge in some of the campaigns I run um, and an ongoing thing that I struggle with session by session. Uh, metagaming is the other one. If I catch it, it will just not happen. And backseat gaming, which speaks to the whole charm modified memory thing. Like you are playing your character nothing you do is allowed to make someone else play their character differently so yeah. charm modify memory all that other stuff unless like we said before that player's okay with it like no let's explore this this could be fun right consent and uh, intent yeah i think um i don't really have any reds for games that i run except for um and you know take this how you will but i don't allow uh sex in my games because one it can get real out of hand way too quickly um and two there's very little times where it's going to be a productive constructive thing happens in the game uh it really doesn't need to be dealt with uh in my opinion um and so I, I tend to say, hey, let's just not deal with it. Um, that being said, relationships are fine. Like uh, in Wrath of the Many, my uh, 
one of my characters has uh, a wife and a daughter. Like the implication that, you know, there is a romantic relationship going on here is okay, but there's, to me, there's really no place for sex on screen. Um, the second thing is I have a kind of yellow red relationship with gaslighting. Um, so charm, uh, and specifically modified memory, because there is really only one scenario where modified memory on another player can be done in a positive way. And that's if the other player asks you to do it. Um, any other way, any way that you are forcing a modified memory on a player is not okay at my tables. Um, but if a player comes to you and has seen like, hey, I've seen the unthinkable, uh, can you erase that part of my memory? Uh, that to me can be done in a way that is productive and constructive. Um, but even then it's still a yellow. Uh, other than that, I feel like I'm very much, uh, I, I could, I, I feel like I'm probably suffering from the same thing Saint has, has claimed. I haven't DM'd enough varieties of people. Uh, I, I always cast very specifically. Um, and so I'm not entirely sure if there are things, uh, but I'm sure I will find out. I just hope like Saint said, I'm not blindsided by that thing. thing it is important said, to note it. too, since Ty froze for a second. Um, it is important too to note that if I am blindsided, that's an instant like cameras off. Right. Yeah. What Done. the? Close it down. Shut it down. Fuck. No problem. Yeah. You, there's no mission to screen. Force. I have it set so you switch to it and all sound is cut off. So I can mm -hmm. literally Same. boop. Right. And we're just we're off stream. <laughs> Something that Ty said really stuck out to me too, because like from the G what is the GM's responsibility uh, when he was talking about what he doesn't allow in his games is like knowing what you, the GM, can adequately manage, right? Like don't introduce themes into your into your games that you don't feel confident that you can handle when they come up, right? Like if you're if it's going to be triggering for you as the GM to have like these kinds of things. Or if you don't think you're going to be able to handle an interaction should it arise between your players, don't have it in your games. Like, we, you don't have to be edgy. You don't have to, like, push the limits of the narrative or, like, <clears throat> mind-blowing. Like, again, I think we all kind of fall into this pitfall of wanting to tell, like, the most interesting, most dynamic, most cool stories. And we've been taught that, like, that means it has to involve edgy, complicated, harsh, horrible things. But as Everyone's a GM, the rogue with dead parents and like right. crazy horrible trauma in their in their crazy backstory. horrible trauma and like you have to introduce crazy horrible trauma in, in order to make your stories interesting. That's not true. And as your GM, as a GM, it's your responsibility to say, this is what I'm capable of managing. If you can't manage it, don't let it be in your game. Yeah, that's right. that's a hundred percent my opinion. Uh, and how I run things like if my if any of my players came to me and said hey I want to do xyz and I Sarah didn't feel like I could approach it in a respectful way mm -hmm. in an informed way in an educated way no sorry dude I, that's really cool and like good on you but I can't I can't help you with that I, I'm ill-equipped uh, right. and being open and honest about what you can actually manage yeah I, I think uh, to, to that point uh, I it's one of the reasons why I also and I should have remembered this I also have a hard read on uh, social issues uh, racism, sexism, xenophobia all of that kind of thing when I am GM GMing when I am GMing I don't want to have that in my game because I genuinely don't think I could handle that and approach that in a way that is respectful and constructive. Um, I, I, it's not that I don't trust myself, it's that I don't feel I am prepared for that. Um, that being said, I'm okay with that kind of stuff in other games as a yellow, because I do believe there are spaces within TTRPGs to discuss those matters. Um, for instance, it's 
it's something that I'm okay with in Curse of Strahd because I trust Luca to handle those matters like xenophobia and racism in a way that is constructive. And I also trust my fellow players to stand up for characters that are experiencing these these problems. Um, Toby. <laughs> like Toby. Uh, like Toby. We, we've, we've discussed, you know, uh, and again, this is something that we discussed very much so before the, the first session even started. Hey, you're bringing a lizard folk into the land of Barovia and these people are going to be very racist and xenophobic towards you. Yeah. Um, that's going to happen. Everyone is okay with it. We've, we've established that everyone is okay with it. That is going to happen, but we are definitely going to be constructive with it. The players are going to help Toby. The players are not going to let, you know, the racist remarks and the xenophobic remarks just stand. Things are going to happen to address what is happening. You know, I think it's I think it's uh, worth mentioning, and I can say this because all three of you have had this revealed to you uh, with Roundhouse. Also, spoilers a little bit, I guess, if you're not caught up or if you don't want to know anything about the greater narrative. Um, your consent form, Ty, and specifically the social issues and everything else that you listed there. There's a reason that you were given a different choice is because a lot of like the outline of the narrative for season two has never really changed like the kind of overall story right. but a lot of the individual kind of moments that go through very much were born out of you know 2020 and a lot of other things that have been going on around the world for the last like five to ten years so like the other cast is exploring some heavy shit that definitely crosses some of those lines that you put there. And I think that this is an example, that's why I wanted to bring it up, of I can still tell the same story while folding in the player, what the players are bringing to the table and what the players are comfortable with. Uh, one thing I want to chime in too, because we've talked a lot about like GMs, like here's what you need to do, GMs, what you need to do. I'm going to like, I would like to, hello players in the chat, and uh, I'm also a player. If you're uncomfortable, if something's wrong, if you're not having a good time, if you're frustrated or whatever, say something. Mm -hmm. Like, Please. say something. Please say you something. You said something earlier, which was assume positive intent. Please assume positive intent, because sometimes... Sometimes, even though I'm trying my hardest, I don't always pick up on the fact that you're not having a good time as a player, or I'm managing stream, or I'm responding to a message from another player that's DMing me like, hey, can I do this next turn? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm doing all that, not to mention pulling up all my notes for the session, looking at stat blocks. Like, I, uh, I'm like managing minority <laughs> report back here, you know, just like going crazy and so it is possible that i a, don't always hear everything you say sometimes i've just got so much going on that like i may not pick up what you say i may not pick up a look on your face that you're trying to assume mm -hmm. positive intent uh if you're not having fun you have to communicate it yeah. Well, and no, the, uh, yeah go for it i think i've sent this i sent this to you sarah i think i don't know if i sent it to any uh, of the other two of you um, there's this really, really great uh, video called 10 Bullets. Uh, it's like a, a rules of uh, working in this one particular, like really well-known designer's workshop. And one of the bullets, like one of the like rules, like the code to live by and work by is a message sent is not a message received. Meaning just because you said it or just because you thought you communicated it or just because you tried to communicate it does not mean I heard it. And it definitely mm -hmm. doesn't mean I understood it. So, like, mm -hmm. unless you get confirmation that the message has been received, assume it has not been received. Mm -hmm. Right. Speak up. Yeah. Right. That's perfect. Yeah. Right. Empower, empower your players to, like, to have a voice of at your tables, right? And not, like, again, there's this fear of the meta or the, like, fear of stepping outside the narrative to, like, accomplish a lot of things, right? Like, one thing I wish, like selfishly we could do more in streamed games is have those meta conversations where it's like whoa 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 dude like 
what do you mean you're going to do that thing? Like, we all as players can hear you making this choice. Can you just, like, break it down for me while you're doing that? And actually have those moments instead of just being like, I'm not cool, I'm not cool, but I'm not going to say anything because I'm not cool. Like, you know, like, convey, like, I wish more... I mean, that feels like a very home game thing to do, but I wish that it was uh, something that was more a part of the interactions, right? That we that we shut it down and we do like show the player side of it on stream or like more openly to say, this is what an interaction should actually look like. Because I think a lot of the times we've talked about some very intense moments, whether it was dark echoes with the Strahd reveal or roundhouse in a number of moments, right? Like we've we've it, it it's it's hard as like someone someone new to ttrpgs or like i'm gonna be honest like if i hadn't have been part of those moments and i just watched i would have been like oh that's so cool i want to do that too and i think that saint already said this i think there's a responsibility uh, within the ttrpg streaming community to talk about like why how those things happen why it's important so we're not just out there traumatizing and re-traumatizing our friends because like we're telling cool edgy stories like it's it's really important to like recognize at the end of the day it's a game i fully yeah. support that like having those meta it, well and it helps because like you know you you see like you see things done like there's no way I could try and replicate Roundhouse just by watching it because of all the shit that goes oh. on behind the scenes that I don't see. It's very much like don't try this at home, kids. Uh, right. And I like, will say all I mean, the stuff that goes into it. We had a lot of conversations beforehand, and I was like, I had one on ones with everyone, and very specifically stated, I'm going to push you. Like there are going to be moments in this campaign that are intentionally pushing boundaries and like Crazy I Sarah need to know that Janet. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know that you're okay with this first of all because it's kind of what you're signing up for but also I really need you to tell me and give me enough so that I know what buttons are safe to push what buttons you might want me to push and what buttons I should like lock off with a glass case with the key and like swallow one bend of the off other players other from yeah. pushing yeah <laughs> yeah no. <laughs> um, one other thing, we talked a little bit about it, um, but I want to make sure we come back to it, is, all right, so you've done all the things. You had your session zero. You've level set with all your players. You've you've gone through. You're communicating behind the scenes or on, like, like stopping things to do the things. Um, and you have someone who was like, yes, here's all my things. You're playing to it. Uh, and then suddenly it's not okay. Like, things are fine until they're not a person's like doing good and then they're triggered uh, for example we talked a little bit off stream this happened to me uh, i was playing the harpers luca did all the things she said here's the consent forms like hey everybody here's some themes that are going to be in today's session particularly like surgery on like live people and there's you know and i was like i'm fine everything's fine i'm the coolest one then we got in session and then it was happening and your girl was not fine like it was <laughs> i was not i was feeling mr Krabs, right um how like again i think i think i already know the answer because we've talked like it really is this common theme over and over but how do you manage it what do you do you have to speak up or if you don't feel comfortable speaking up message behind the scenes or if even that is a little too much for you because you're feeling it mr crabs step up and walk away from your there's this pressure of like the watching audience the show must go on i've just gotta like march through because we're on a stream show and it's like no get up and just step away you know and the dm will notice and we can we can go to intermission we can we can stop we can cool things down we can even just end the session with like a like a healing little meta talk of like yeah. what's going on you know i think uh i i definitely think the, the theme is like when it's it's okay till it's not okay and when it becomes not okay you have to have the conversation period mm -hmm. it's our responsibility to have the hard conversations and i think especially on a streamed game 
if it's one of those more severe cases where you know you're getting into the whole like walk away but it's still not okay and we're going to end the session i think that's it's a teaching opportunity for both the players and the viewers to be like hey didn't know the line existed or the that something has happened that has changed the dynamic we are stopping because that's not okay and here's how we're going to handle it and i think a little bit of that like that uh meta healing kind of aftercare moment mm -hmm. is actually important to have on stream if you can and if everybody's comfortable with it right. because you know it's i think the reason that we're all saying like consent is key and like communication is key is because far too often it has not been for either us or we've seen it in other places mm -hmm. and so like it, it we basically like we need to normalize it we just need to normalize mm -hmm. it at tables that's all mm -hmm. I, I think, think a lot uh, of people go, prefer... go. Okay. <laughs> uh, just a lot of people i think view confrontation like they view confrontational conversations as antagonistic conversations when they don't yes it's confrontation you are bringing up a subject that is going to change something or request change or something like that you know uh, saying you are not okay with a certain thing but it doesn't put you at odds with who you're about to have the conversation with i mean if like uh, if someone were having a problem at my table and they were shying away from the confrontation of having the conversation with me like i would feel terrible like i'm on your team it's there's like yes there's confrontation but it's not antagonistic i'm here for you like you're coming to me with a change for request or a request for change like yes let's change it like i like we're on the same team so i want like i have you at my table because i asked you to be at my table we're all playing together that means i want to tell stories with you but if you're not having fun telling stories let's change the story right we can it's all flexible it's mm. it's it's imagination like <laughs> things can be different we just have to make it so ty you were gonna say something Yes, one thing that I want to bring up, uh, because Aftercare was brought up, uh, is the incredible work uh, by Last HP Hero. Um, and all of the Aftercare yes. he does after every session that he runs with uh, Cold Hands, Warm Hearts, Darkest Night, Darkest Light. Um, there is always an Aftercare portion of the session. Uh, and a lot of a lot of good conversations and a lot of uh tense feelings have been kind of talked about and explained and uh there's been resolution sometimes in, in those aftercare sessions and it's it's really cool to see it's not something you normally see in in stream ttrpgs and i honestly think it should be more normalized um I think it's I think it's really cool, and even and no matter what, I think there should be some sort of aftercare discussion, whether it's on stream or not. Uh, it's really cool if you can do it on stream. If if the cast and the GM, re, you know, trust each other enough to to do that and are comfortable with with you know talking about their feelings and and their characters' feelings and whatnot on screen, I think that's really cool. Um, but even if even if that's not something that's possible you really should be doing it off screen uh, because you don't want your players walking away with better taste in their mouth having to wait a week, two weeks, a month, you know, however long you're okay, having to wait uh, to, you know, to talk about those things. Uh, and I think uh, we at TBK do that pretty well uh, and not necessarily on screen. I, I you know we have that on screen here and there uh hb is really the only one that does it every single time um but we do all stick around afterwards and talk about what happened and how we're feeling and what like for instance um and and again spoiler alert for the mask of uh uh dark echoes uh i felt physically sick after that episode uh like viscerally physically sick uh and oh you know what no no it wasn't it was i mean yes but the episode before that 
uh, where my action um, essentially yes. spelled doom <laughs> for oh. the party, or at least how I felt. I felt that it was it was I felt that the thing that I had done was going to kill the party, and that we ended the episode right there, essentially just chopped it off. And I remember just feeling this horrible feeling. And thankfully, we were all able to kind of stick around and talk about it and be like, hey, it's okay. Um, you know, everything's going to be okay. And if it's not okay, we're, it's not like it's the end. It's a TPK. Death is not the end. Um, like everything was, everything was okay. Uh, and eventually I was able to calm down. Uh, but man, if, if we hadn't had that conversation and I had just kind of gone off stream and, and let it rot and ruminate, oh, I can't even imagine how I would have felt. Uh, so yes, aftercare is very important. And yeah. I, you you actually made something you brought something up in my mind too. It kills me to think that a player has had those moments and hesitations about speaking up, and it's gone on for session and session and session and session, and then suddenly they do speak up. Like it breaks my heart. And like, like you said, with like, uh, if that aftercare wouldn't have happened, like you were not okay after that session, and you like, what would have happened if you would have just let it kind of fester inside you? Like, I, I pray that everybody knows that it's safe to speak up at my table, right. or to speak up to me privately, and that they do so when it happens and don't let it sit, because it just it's it's heartbreaking. I don't want anybody to have to go through that whether it's caused by me or caused by someone else, to know that I could have done something had I known earlier is just... Right. We're not I don't want to say unacceptable because I know that there are reasons why somebody would hesitate to do that, but like, please just talk, <laughs> tell me. Right, say something. Uh, one thing I want to add in here too, like something, uh, again, selfishly as the GM, like uh, in these kind of like after session, after care things, like tell your GM what you liked. Like, tell your GM what worked. Tell your GM, like, what was fun, what wasn't, what was interesting, what wasn't. Like, I think a lot of times, like, as a GM, it can be really challenging. You just ran a, a you know, two to eight hour session or however, or somewhere in between. You get done with the game. Everybody's like, well, cool, later. And you just bounce. Like, those aftercare sessions are, like, really important for not only the players, but for the GMs. Like... I can't tell you like how like gratifying it is to like hear players say like I really liked XYZ that worked for me and it enables the GM to do more cool things like that like we're not mind readers and like yes I'm there to tell a story but I'm not I don't want to tell a story that no one's interested in mm -hmm. I don't I'm not interested in telling a story that people aren't don't feel safe in to Saint's point so like Tell your GMs, like talk to them, tell them what worked, what didn't, what you liked, what you didn't like, tell them about your theories. Like there's a, this other concept of like, it's us versus the GM and they have secrets and we have secrets and like, no, like put it out on the table, talk about it, tell the story with your GM, like tell them your ideas, your theories. Cause I guarantee, I guarantee they're going to use it and then like, it's going to be better for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, uh, G I mean, it's at least for me, when I GM, I, I like to play it very fast and loose. Uh, I, while I do maintain the rules of D and D um, for combat, none of those rules are going to be a you know a hard stop. Right? If a player wants to do something extremely cool, uh, and you know it can be explained somewhat, like why not have that extremely cool thing happen? Right? Um, also, if a player comes to you, uh, uh, you know, after session or between sessions and is like, hey, this is a goal that I have for the campaign. Do you think you can, like, integrate that? Like, yeah. Thank you for helping me plan the next session. <laughs> like, it's, it's very much like, hey, we understand that you guys want to tell a story, right? And we want to tell a story, but there is a way where we can tell both the stories at the same time. Um, and it's very much, that's where collaborative storytelling comes in. And sometimes, sometimes, uh, GMs may have hard moves, right? That they want 
to happen for narrative reasons. And while there's not always a, uh, th that's not necessarily going to be like a, hey, this is something we cannot prevent, right? Like this, this blah, blah, blah is going to die no matter what, uh, or, you know, however you want to take that. Um, you, the, the players can, you know, have those moments of, this is what I want to happen. And hey, we'll rework the script. Or hey, this is what I don't want to happen. Like what we do with the player consent form. And so that is, you know, a lot of how I was basing. I think I've said this already, but a lot of how I was, how I planned Wrath of the Penning was based around, hey, this is what I can do and what I can't do. And also, I don't know where, I don't know exactly where it came from first, but I, I got the five, four, three, two, one um character checklist from it's amazing i believe sarah i got it from noir i don't know okay. where noir got it but it's like the coolest five four three yeah. two one for character development do it give it to your yes, gm it's incredible and one of those things one of the categories in there is hey these are goals that my character has for this campaign and these are goals that my player that i the player have for this campaign and i have built the entire campaign which I will say is four sessions, so it has to be pushed a little bit. Uh, but I've built a lot of the campaign around those goals, how we want to you know, resolve those goals so that everybody feels like they've got some sort of closure, completion. Absolutely. Um, in terms of like DM hard movements, if it makes you feel any better, that ritual circle just made it easier for me, but that left turn, no matter how many times you guys took that left turn, it always still went right. <laughs> uh, we were going to end up there uh, no matter what. It just, right. you know, uh, it, you just it, presented a very easy moment for it to happen, yeah. uh, making my job much uh, less hard. <laughs> Exactly. And I think Saint with the uh, finale for Roundhouse, uh, when I tried to summon the Archangels and you were like, well, <laughs> I feel like that was kind of along the same lines. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And it was um, a good portion. I won't say the majority of, but a good portion of the season two narrative shifted when you did that. So for all of you players out there, know that you can be influential and make things happen. Uh, and you should, you should try. Feel Just empowered. make sure that you're doing it in a respectful way to both the other players or the GM. And post GM or post session GM blues are a real thing. Help your yes. GMs know what's cool and what's not. Please, for the love of God, we're all screaming inside. We just want you to have a fun time <laughs> and like what we're doing. Please, God, please. <laughs> you having fun? Is everybody having fun? Was that neat? I did this thing for you. Did, did you, you like, like it? it? Did you I like worked please? at it all week. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that puts us uh, pretty close to time. Um, yep. I want to huge thanks to saint and luca and chat for like doing all the things um i'm uh for chat i'm getting a 54321 like google doc link uh set up real quick and i'll drop that in chat here momentarily um but i'm gonna kick it over thank to you Tantus. i was furiously scrambling through my yeah no google i'm, I'm, Where I'm is almost it? <laughs> almost got it we're almost there so um i will post that in chat uh, and i'll also post it in tdk show discussions in our discord uh so if you like these kinds of conversations we have a great community uh tdk roleplay uh come join the discord so you can see all the cool fun things that we're doing uh it's mm -hmm. the best so and anyways. if you'd like to see more conversations like this uh, some of those conversations being with these incredible guests that we have here. Uh, you can check out the Murder and Coffee playlist on YouTube, which uh, I, yep, there it is. It's in chat. Thank you, Heck. Uh, you can check that out. It's got a lot of awesome uh, content, very much like this, uh, anywhere between uh, writing adventures and one shots uh, to acting principles, which uh, we did with our incredible guest here, Dean of Saints, uh, and so many more uh, topics. I believe, Sarah, to give a little bit of a taste of what we have next, I believe we're going to be talking a little bit about home games, I think is an idea that you have. 
Yes, I want to talk more about home games because a lot of these things, like the principles apply, but like it's just different. Like you're sitting around with friends. Like I want to talk about the experience of jamming an in-person game, something that most of us haven't like been able to do. Hashtag twenty twenty exactly. things. So yeah. I, I would like to talk about that. I, I'd, I also hope that we can do more deep dives on different systems. We did a Dungeon Master Guide deep dive uh, a couple months ago, which I absolutely loved. Uh, and there's more stuff like that that I want to do, whether it's you know running how to run games in different systems, whether we like them, where we be, whether we don't. Also, chat. I know we have a bunch of new folks in the chat. If there are folks that you want to like, if there are DMs or DM GMs that you like admire or respect, like. Uh, tweet at me or Ty. Like, who do you want us to talk to, and what do you want us to talk to them about? We love having guests uh, to kind of bounce ideas off and, and learn from. So, if there are folks out there that you want to see or hear from, uh, let us know. Yes, exactly. And not along the same lines, if you have a specific topic that we've not covered that you think would be really cool for us to deep dive into, do the same. Tweet us or message us on Discord. We would love to hear your input. Um, but I believe that is time so let's go around real quick uh sarah what do you have coming up that we can talk about um yeah just really quick i'm osarix franco and you can find me on twitch and twitter at osarix franco um uh what do i have coming up uh stick around here at tbk roleplay uh because in a few hours i will be gming uh in my homebrew campaign the bard's refrain uh with my two lovely players here both saint and luca if we're talking about choosing tables um it should be a very good session i have a cool thing that we're doing um that is very cool and that's all i'll say about that uh you can also find me in a variety of shows here on tbk uh, roleplay as a player uh, monday in the atrium of aquarius our uh altered carbon campaign i'm in our DD campaign uh, the harpers on tuesday uh, you can find me over at nat 20 uh, run by the incredible saint uh, on Thursday for Roundhouse Alpha, a Monster of the Week campaign. And then back here on Friday in a, uh, I'm not sure what the system is, but it's run by Fazul. Uh, there's something wrong with the rats. Uh, this one, he, Fazul said that no, no time that he's run this has ever, everyone survived. Like, so I think we're all going to die uh, and I'm here for it. <laughs> so uh, come check that out. Um, you can find me in other shows uh, across Nat 20 or uh, here on TBK Roleplay, Against the Tides, uh, Roundhouse uh, Omega, Morningstar and Company, which is one of my favorites. I, every Sunday is so good. Um, so yeah, all, all the things. Uh, and I'm going to kick it down. We'll just go counterclockwise, or no, clockwise. Let's talk about Saint. Uh, I'm actually not going to pitch anything for myself. Uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, there's a TBK community member named Young Foxy who has a really great uh, channel that they're working on uh, called Beyond Lights Roleplay uh, that you should go check out. At least a couple people in chat are in some of their shows, so it is definitely worth it. Also, he's a player in uh, Roundhouse Omega here on TPK. Um, also, a close friend of mine uh, started making dice. Uh, you might or might not know him as Dorseus. Uh, he's a member of like the Smile Squad. He's been a, a friend of mine for pretty much since I started streaming. Uh, and he started pouring and polishing dice and he's trying to get it off the ground. Uh, it's called Black Knight Dice. Um, I think, yeah. So the Instagram for Black Knight Dice is there. So I just wanted to shout those two things out. I think, who's next? Luca? Luca. Luca. Me! Hi, I'm Luca Lock. I am sometimes player, mostly GM uh, and design coordinator. For TPK roleplay, I am uh, back tonight playing Bird in Bard's Refrain, um, so I'll probably be crying a lot. I'm hoping that who I think tonight's episode is focusing on will spare me some of the usual crying, but we'll see. Who knows? Now I'm curious. Who do you um, think it's focusing on? Bootstrap. Interesting. We'll have to, we'll have to find out. We'll have oh, to find God. out. Okay. Well, now I'm scared. It better not be me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tomorrow, though, I am uh, I'm partnering with D&D &D Elise again, and we are doing Women in Gaming 2021. Um, we are with uh, it's an online event. Uh, we're going to have a fellowship game run by me in the morning, a panel in the afternoon, and then the weekend at Strahd's run by D&D &D Elise in the afternoon. 
Um, after that, and all uh, events are uh, all all proceeds are going to Hope Haven uh, Women's Shelter. So it's a good cause, and you guys should come out. And then I'm back for some Altered Carbon Monday, and then Harper's. I'm running on Tuesday, uh, and that's it for the next week for me. Uh, over to Ty. Hello, I'm Tyrant. You can find me on Twitch and Twitter at Dr. Tyrant. Uh, gosh, um, thank you all for coming and talking about this incredible talk. To talk, talk it. Uh, that's that's uh, topic uh, with us. It's it's always Coffee a pleasure talk. to have both of you uh, as guests on Murder and Coffee. Um, as for what I have coming up, um, I am off until Monday for Atrium of Aquarius, uh, our Ultra Carbon uh, campaign. Uh, my character is a deep doo doo and will most likely die uh, in this episode. So if you want to see that happen, <laughs> come check it out. Um, on Tuesday, I will be in Harper Investigations, achieved by the incredible Luca Lock. Uh, I will be playing my Locks Dog Cleric, Ego. Uh, it is so much fun uh, to play uh, a big boy uh, again. I miss Gruff every single day, uh, and it's it's nice to be able to play uh, a big elephant now. Um, uh, Thursday will be session two of Wrath of the Mini. Uh, this is a four-part mini-series uh, designed to tell a whole level 5 to 20 campaign in uh, four episodes. Uh, they started at level 5 and will be level 10 this coming up episode. And uh, the, <laughs> the first episode was very tense and uh, dramatic, and I think... We're probably going to have along the same lines for the second episode. Uh, so definitely come for that if you want to see how it ramps up, how the story progresses. Uh, and then that's about it for me. Uh, I am doing a lot of home brewing on my downtime. Uh, a lot of that is being released to the Patreon if you're interested in checking that out. Uh, but I will also... Uh, I also have multiple projects out for multiple TPK GMs. Uh, so you may see some of my monsters and creations in future games. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Why is Sarah making the face? I'm making the face because you're working on something for me. Why is Sarah making the face? What? I don't know what you're talking about. What? No. Who? Who? What? Wait. Hey, it's going to be okay. It's okay. going to be fine. Probably. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, guests. Thank you, Sarah. Always. Thank you, Ty. Uh, and thank you, chat, for uh, coming out and supporting us today. Be sure to come back tonight for what is going to be a freaking amazing episode of The Bars Refrain. I know a secret, and it's going to be amazing. I'm just scared now. Yeah. It's fine. That's it's my happy. Fine. That's my happy but stressed out GM dance. I hope it turns <laughs> out, you guys. Yeah. Uh, but as always, please, chat, remember to keep your coffee hot. And your murder's cold. We'll see you later, guys. Bye. Bye for now.